Good morning, everybody. Come on, let's stand to our feet. Let's worship the Lord together. Come on, hands up. Here we go. Goodbye, yesterday. I'm living in the light of a new day. I won't waste another minute in my old ways. Praise the Lord, I've been born again. The 
my soul should know its savior. Forsaken for the sake of all mankind, salvation is in his blood. Jesus, Messiah, the right just died for love.
Church, we are in a time of 21 days of prayer and fasting. If this is your first time you're hearing about it, don't worry, go to the website, it's on the homepage. There's a guide for these 21 days of prayer and fasting. And today, there is an emphasis on physical healing. So today in our worship service, we wanted to set aside some time to just pause and pray. Our uh, prayer team is gonna come up here to the front. And if you are in need of physical healing, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God is healer, God is good, God sees you. So if you are in need of physical healing at any point as the band continues to play, uh, feel free to come on up for prayer. And if you are healthy and you don't need physical healing right now, would you partner in prayer and pray for those that do? All of us, I'm sure, know somebody whether they're here in this room or not, friends or family that can really use a touch from God. So let's bring these needs before the Lord. And as the band continues to play, pray, uh, play will we partner in pray? All right. the surface of my anxious imagination beckons a calmness that is found in you alone it washes over every doubt every Jesus, your presence is the comfort of my soul. There's nowhere I'd rather be than when you're singing over me. I just
presence fall Let your presence fall when I was thinking and pondering, um, this word consumed kept sticking out to me. And so I asked the Lord, what? <laughs> and the question came like, what am I allowing myself to be consumed by? What have I allowed in my mind? What have I allowed in my heart to be consumed by? Is it busyness and success? Is it just my attention in general has gone away where it's taking my eyes off the Lord. What is it that I have allowed myself to be consumed by? What is it that I need to pour out? What is it that I need to get rid of? What is it that I need to offer in faith to the Lord to allow Him to consume it? And allow myself to be consumed by His healing and good and powerful presence. I'm a very visual person, and I kept getting this like image in my mind of the story of Elijah. And uh, you guys may be familiar with it, where Elijah is pleading with Israel. He's telling Israel, hey, your, your attention has gone away from me. They were serving Baal at the time, which was a false god. And Elijah was pleading with Israel, you can't serve both. You can't be consumed by both. You're either consumed by the false god or you are consumed by Yahweh, the Lord. You gotta, you gotta lay it down. 
So Elijah says uh, to the people, he said, okay, we are gonna call on these gods. We're gonna call on Baal, we're gonna call on the Lord. And whichever God responds with fire, that is the one true God. So, so the prophets of Baal, they get their wood, they get their, um, they get their, their sacrifice, the bull, and they prepare their altar. They set everything up as it should be and they didn't light it because God was supposed to, their God was supposed to light it. So they prepare everything, they put it out there. They call on the name of Baal and nothing happens. There is no fire. There is no answer at all. So now Elijah's up and Elijah gets the fire. He prepares stones representing Israel. He gets the sacrifice and prepares it. He gets it all in that one spot and he doesn't light it because that's God's job. Elijah does one more thing before he calls on the name of the Lord and he gets these big vats of water and pours it over the entire altar. Have you ever lit a fire before? Not a good idea. Uh, he doesn't do that just one time. He does it three times. He pours water on the entire altar. And then he calls on the name of the Lord. One thing we have to remember, in the Bible, fire is often associated with God's presence. We hear the story of Moses when he encountered the burning bush. That was God's presence. Later on in the Bible, we hear the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they were sent into this fiery furnace, and there's a fourth man in the fire that just wasn't there when they walked in. God's presence. And on the flip side, there's water. Uh, in, in the very beginning of Genesis, we see that there's chaos waters, these chaos waters, and God in creation controls that and puts order to it. We also see uh, the Israelites, when they are leaving Egypt in the, in the great exodus, they are at the edge, the water's edge of the Red Sea, where it was impossible to cross unless God's presence came and parted it for them, and he did it. So we have this story of fire and water coming head to head. So here we are, Elijah puts the water every, all over everywhere, and then he calls on the name of the Lord, and God shows up. His presence in this great fire comes down, laps up the stone, laps up the wood, laps up the sacrifice, and laps up those chaos waters. God is the God of the impossible. So I ask myself again, Lord, what am I allowing myself to be consumed by? What waters am I hoarding for myself in my own comfort, thinking that I can do it in and of my own control, that I need to be pouring out and letting you consume it. He said, Jesus says, I have come to give life and give life to the fullest. So these waters that we're hoarding and that we're even drowning in, we need to pour it out on the altar and let the Lord consume it because he loves you. He loves you. And he's saying, would you just pour it out and let me handle it, let me take control, let me, let me love you, is what he's saying. So we ask ourselves again, what are we consumed by? What thoughts have we left creep in that, that consume us that we need to pour out and let God's spirit cleanse it? So we're just gonna pause Again, the band's gonna continue to play for a few moments. And would you just take some you and God time and ask him, Lord, what have I been consumed by? What is it that I need to pour out in faith and let you handle it?
God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you that in your presence there is healing, there is clarity, there is purity, there is hope. So God, may we be a people that that want your presence, that pause and give enough time to hear your voice and respond in obedience. Father, we love you and may your holy and perfect will be done this morning. And in Jesus' name, the church says, amen. 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 Helps if you turn on the mic. I say good morning. You may be seated. Welcome. I uh, want to say, especially if you are a first-time guest with us or maybe haven't been in a while, make yourself at home. Welcome home. Uh, we would love to get you connected if you are not already. Uh, you can uh, connect with us with the QR code on the screens, or better yet, Paul, there's a hard copy in the seat back in front of them. But we just want to say welcome. Uh, if you don't know this, we have services for the whole family. Uh, we have an early childhood, infant through five-year-olds, downstairs. We've got a dynamic kids ministry. That's kindergarten through fifth grade. And then on Tuesday nights, we have sixth through 12th grade. This week is going to be their annual Thanksgiving. We're going to have a couple hundred students Did you say on a couple campus. hundred? A couple hundred students. Oh, Tuesday man. night, I'll be feeding some turkey. It's going to be amazing. That's awesome. Good morning, everyone. One of the great classes we have here is called Growth Track. If you're new here, this is a way that you can get to know what the Bay Church is about. You can get connected with us. You can text the number 77411, and that's a way to sign up. Also, we're a church that believes in the power of prayer. Amen, right? Amen. All right, so if you text the number on the screen throughout the week, we've got people set up to pray for you. And if you would like prayer after service, you can see prayer on the wall over there. Just head over there, and there will be someone who can pray with you. If you feel the cool air, you can tell the holidays are almost on us. And I can neither confirm nor deny that I've been listening to Christmas music already. But oh, man. as we move into the holiday seasons, I want to highlight a couple of big moments that are happening. A week from Wednesday, that's the 27th of November, that's the night before Thanksgiving, we are having our annual Thanksgiving Eve service. It's a time for us to gather together as a faith community and do one thing that Wednesday night, right before Thanksgiving, is to praise God and thank him for the many blessings that both you and I have experienced this year. It's going to be amazing, so mark down Wednesday, November 27th. Join us. You know, a little insight for our church family here about our Pastor John. If he had it his way, he would listen to Christmas music and have his house set up for Christmas all year round. All year round. Is there anyone like that here? I, I am not about that. You got to have a season for it. Uh, so, anyways, Christmas is coming up. Woohoo! So, when you walked in, you saw a card on your chair. Can you hold it up high? Okay, you have one job. You have to give this card to someone else. So, don't lose it. It can be someone you know, it can be someone you don't know. But we want to invite the world to our church. We're going to have seven services. Say seven services. Okay, seven. we're going to have five on the 22nd. We're going to have hot cocoa. I, I hear Santa may even be showing up. And we're going to have a petting zoo. Jason, you know what they say about petting zoos? Oh, Paul, please it, tell me. It's hard to have a bad time. <laughs> I told that joke wrong in the first service, so I nailed it there. Um, and then on the 24th, uh, we're going to have two services. That's our Christmas Eve service, a real special time of just getting together. We're going to have candlelight, just an opportunity uh, to be together as a church family on Christmas Eve. Sounds like the beginning of a good Christmas song. Five services. Didn't you? Okay. Uh, last but not least, <laughs> uh, you guys continue to amaze me with your generosity, especially this time and season of the year. Through our compassion bags, through your giving, through the Bay Church, uh, if you call the Bay Church home, we're going to continue worshiping through giving in just a moment. And there are three ways that you can invest through the Bay Church. You can drop it in the buckets as the ushers come forward in just a moment. Uh, you can uh, text the number on the screen. You can also give online through our uh, Bay Church app or at the Bay uh, dot church forward slash give, or you can drop it off in the back boxes on your way out the door. Well, as the buckets begin to pass, and part of the holiday season, why don't you turn towards your neighbor and give them a warm greeting and tell them how glad you are that they're here.
right. Good morning, guys. How you doing? I see I'm Ryan. I'm going to teach the Bible this morning. Uh, let me start with a story. It's pretty interesting. I heard it the other day. So there was a group of seminary students, young men and women, training to be pastors, whatever, uh, who went on a field trip with their professor because this particular group was training for ministry abroad. So they needed exposure to foreign cultures, foreign religions. So the professor took them to a Hare Krishna temple. And, you know, we got several of those here in the Bay Area. They went inside, and it's pretty different than a church. Uh, they had to take off their shoes and go in with their socks or bare feet. And in the temple, you know, you go inside, and there's some people doing yoga over there, and, and some people over here chanting the name of Krishna, the Hindu god who's painted on all the walls with blue skin. And, uh, you know, the, the class toured the temple. A nice lady showed them around. And on their way out, they were each given a little handful of homemade Krishna candy. Just to say, like, hey, thanks for stopping by. I hope you had a nice visit. And, uh, but when they got out to the parking lot, most of the seminary students right away were like, I, mean, I ain't eating this. They threw it away. You know, it's, I don't know. It's going to pollute me somehow. This stuff is just, no, I'm not doing that. But the last one to come out of the temple was the professor. And when he did, the students were all stunned because the guy's cheeks were just full of candy. Who we was sucking and chomping away, loving it. And he goes up to a student about to throw his candy away and says, hey, you going to, like, eat that? Because otherwise, like, you know, hand it over, dude. Now, who do you think is right here? How does that story make you feel? Are the students right to stay away from any food affiliated with another religion? Or is the professor's nonchalant attitude right? Like, there's just candy. It's no spell on it or anything. Well, actually... This is a little bit of a gray area, because from a biblical perspective, the answer isn't just about the right theology, it also has to do with someone's personal backstory. Like, for example, maybe one of the students came to Jesus from a Hindu background and has real sensitivities about like eating Krishna candy or, or for that matter, going to a temple at all, just kind of like, stay away from all that stuff, that's in my past, and I, I no. On the other hand, the professor seems to be signaling like, hey, Krishna's not real. I'm not threatened by a little bit of candy here. And this very dilemma actually is in the background of today's Bible passage. Uh, the first century Jesus movement was mixed. It had some believers from a pagan background who had no dietary restrictions, just eat whatever. And then others from a Jewish background who had observed kosher laws all their life, and they're not about to stop. In fact, in the couple centuries before Paul and Jesus Many Jews had chosen literally to die, to become martyrs, rather than to eat pork and other food uh, that the Torah forbids. Like, they're very serious about this. Uh, but from a Gentile perspective, it seems a little bit crazy. It's like, like my big fat Greek wedding. Like, you don't need no meat? It's okay, I make lamb. <laughs> you ever seen that movie? I love that movie. Uh, this becomes a real, like, pickle for the early church. How can these two groups of Jesus followers live side by side, break bread together in unity, when the dinner menu is at risk of splitting the church? I mean, churches have split over less things before. And in today's passage, Paul's going to address the problem, but not as either group would like. Uh, he doesn't take the bait of making this sort of a black and white either-or issue. Either the, the Jewish customs for food, that just becomes the norm for everybody, or the Gentile freedom and liberty, that's the norm for everybody. That's kind of a zero-sum game approach, like you win, you lose, and Paul doesn't do that. Rather, he takes this as an opportunity to teach a much deeper lesson than church power politics. It's a lesson about love that he's ultimately teaching us, and more specifically, the angle is, this will be our title and theme today, is handling gray areas with grace, handling gray areas with grace. I thought about calling the sermon, let's make like a church and split, but I decided against it. Uh, <clears throat> you'll get it later. Uh, here's a fact, a fact about life. We just can't ignore that much of life, even Christian life, is filled with gray areas, actually. There are uh, non-black and white issues on which thoughtful, Jesus-loving people actually disagree with each other. Can Christians watch R-rated movies? Should children be homeschooled or sent to public school? Should we baptize children, even babies, or do you have to wait till you're an adult? Can Christians drink alcohol? Or did Jesus chain water, change water into grape juice? What? I don't know. Should services be scripted? 
Or should you just kind of see where the spirit leads? Is there a worship style that God prefers? Is he like a hymns guy? Or does he like groove with Hillsong? Uh, which I'm sorry, I know that was like so five years ago. Uh, but you get the point. There are gray areas where thoughtful, Jesus-loving people disagree. And here's what we need to know uh, about that. We have to learn to tell the difference between commands on the one hand and personal convictions on the other. There are clear commands from God, non-negotiable. It's just boom, it's what it is. But there are other areas that are, are personal convictions, and it's so important to notice the difference. The Bible's clear, unambiguous on some things. Don't lie. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. Salvation is through Jesus. Like, these things are clear. They're not really iffy. Uh, but there are other areas where the Bible's teaching is less clear. And unless we learn how to navigate those gray areas with some grace and wisdom, what's going to happen is that we're going to end up living in splintered off, self-righteous, pseudo-Christian tribes. And that's not what God wants. Uh, but the good news is that the very same obstacles to Christian unity that we have in the 21st century were already there in the first century. So today, what we're going to be doing by really listening closely to Romans chapter 14, it's our passage today, uh, we'll really be making an investment in unity, in cross-cultural families, friendships, and ultimately like the capital C global church. The church from go by design is a multi-ethnic people of God. Many cultures, one Lord. It's a great vision, but how to work that out gets a little tricky. So here we go. The passage starts like this, Romans 14. Paul says, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. Let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you, by the way, to pass judgment on the servant of another? It's before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. <clears throat> so Paul begins by reminding readers something important, that they're ultimately accountable not to each other, but to God, and this changes the way then that they see each other. He's trying to teach them. Don't see each other as like, oh, she's Jewish and he's a Gentile. No, see them differently. They are servants of the one Lord, just like I am. And if the master has welcomed them, then who am I to reject them? It's very simple, actually. All of Christian ethics has what has been called a, a, a structure of as so. As God does so should we do. As God treats us, so we should treat each other. And in many ways, this is like better than the golden rule. The golden rule is do to others what you would do to them. But this is do to others what God would do to them. Sometimes I wouldn't be nice to people, but God is uh, even better. And Paul is saying to both Jew and Gentile here, each who are biased to say, oh, that guy just walked into forbidden territory, Paul is saying, hey, God has welcomed that person, so you need to welcome them too. So we've got these two groups. You've got the weak people who eat only veggies and the strong people who eat anything. And Paul's strategy is not to give a simple up and down, like you're right, you're wrong. Rather, he puts both groups on notice that they're not in a position to judge each other at all. Only God sees into the heart. Now, for Paul, as a Jewish man... To relax kosher laws in any way was a big deal. And, but in this, in this matter, he's just following the precedent set down by Jesus. Listen to what the Messiah says uh, in Mark chapter 7. Mark is usually seen as the earliest gospel. Jesus says this, Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside, food, cannot defile him since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? Literally, it goes into the toilet. Thus he declared all foods clean. And that's, that's not my parenthetical statement, that's St. Mark's. Jesus declared all foods clean. And he says, it's what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, 
slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they are what defile a person. So all these broken attitudes and actions come out of an unregenerated heart. And it's interesting that Paul puts his finger on a couple of those as the natural attitudes that the strong and the weak have towards each other. Did you notice it? In uh, verse 3 of our passage today, Paul says this, let not the one who eats food, you know, the forbidden food, whatever, Krishna candy, let them not despise, literally count as nothing, feel superior to the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment to denounce, to condemn, to throw out of court the one who eats. So think about this like the psychology of driving on a multi-lane highway, okay? You know, there's like four lanes all going in the same direction, speed limit 65, slower traffic is on the right, theoretically, faster traffic is on the left, and there's a psychodrama going on. The guy in the far right lane, far right lane he's like going 63 because he keeps the speed limit. It's the law. And there's cars just flying by him. And what is he thinking in his heart at that moment? He's thinking, those hooligan lawbreakers. I hope the cops bust them. <laughs> law and order, baby. Natural attitude of the heart is to condemn those people who are going too much. But on the other hand, the folks in the left lane, Breezing by at 85 miles an hour. Man, they're bending the law as far as it's going to go. What's going on in their heart at the moment? What are they thinking? Suckers. <laughs> you don't know what you're missing. You guys are so silly. Like, you can go faster, you know. And <clears throat> they're just, they feel superior. They feel smarter. And then there's the truly horrific situation uh, when the guy decides to teach everybody a lesson by going the speed limit in the fast lane. You know, this is the guy who's going 64 in the fast lane, and there's like a dozen or two cars piled up behind. You can like almost hear the conversation this man is having with his wife. She's sitting there, and she's like, honey, uh, there's a lot of cars behind. Maybe we can get in a different lane. And he's like, I won't be intimidated, dear. I'm going the speed limit. <laughs> and meanwhile, nobody's a Christian anymore. Like, it's just, <laughs> it's just total madness. And uh, by the way, if you're wondering which lane I choose to drive in, I won't tell you. But I will tell you this. I have tinted windows and no Jesus stickers on my car. I'm just saying. <laughs> because, uh, well, never mind. <laughs> Here's the point, okay? Paul is speaking to two groups. He's speaking to the strong people in the fast lane and the weak people in the slow lane. He's saying to this, neither of you get to follow your own inclinations here. Because the weak are prone to point their finger at the liberalism of those strong people. Uh, and the strong just kind of shrug their shoulders at the legalism of the weak. Does that make sense? There's a spectrum from like liberalism to legalism. And we're on one side pointing at the other. And Paul says, all y'all need to have a reality attitude check right now. Because what's going on in both of your hearts isn't quite pleasing to God. So let's read a few more verses. Let's get some more material because Paul's going to bring out another sticky issue alongside food. He's going to talk about calendar stuff. Listen to this. So Paul says, one person esteems one day is better than another, while another esteems all days alike. What's the difference? Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats... Eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, they don't eat, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. So Paul's giving us a good rule of thumb here. It's very helpful. Whatever we choose to do or don't do, what matters is whether that course of action can be done in honor of the Lord and giving worship to God. Like, it's just ask yourself for things you do in your daily life. Is this something I could do with Jesus in the room with me? Is this something I can do with one eye on him? as an act of worship? If yes, it's probably a green light. If no, it's a red light. But again, it's not like there's some exhaustive list somewhere in the Bible of all possible courses of conduct and we get clear red lights or green lights for all of them. There are yellow lights. There are gray areas, things that are more about personal conviction than clear command. And I love what Paul says here in verse five. He says this, each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. So it's not sort of like a Lucy relativism, everything goes. No, think it through. 
What is the right path for you? So I'll give you an example of something I have a personal conviction about, very strong. It's not a command. And I'm probably a weak Christian in this regard. Uh, The issue is the Sabbath. For me and my family, Sabbath is non-negotiable. It's extremely, extremely important. And I'm convinced in my mind that Jesus didn't cancel the Sabbath. He was very interested in it because he wanted to purify it and beautify it. And that Christians ignore a weekly Sabbath at their own peril. So that's a whole other sermon. But here's the point. I realize that many thoughtful Christians disagree with me on this, and I'm okay with that. I wasn't always, but I am okay with that. They have, a, honestly, like a certain liberty in this matter, and frankly, just like stamina that I don't have. If I didn't have one day a week of pure rest, I'd have a meltdown. But still, I'm, con- I'm convinced, like I've got reasons, uh, that I think Sabbath is part of God's blueprint for flourishing human life, regardless of what your inner battery strength is. But at the same time, I recognize that in the new era inaugurated by Jesus, that keeping a rigorous weekly Sabbath is actually a gray area, and there is liberty in this matter. And throughout the ages, many Christians have found a compass, a a, a way to thread the needle through gray areas in a saying that is often attributed to St. Augustine, fourth century African theologian. St. Augustine said this, he said, Here's, the, here's, here's what you got to aim for. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. It's a very beautiful statement, very wise. Uh, but it begs the question, okay, well, who gets to decide which issues go in which buckets? How do I know if something is essential or non-essential? And the answer is simple, actually, although it's not easy to implement. The umpire is the Bible. The only way to tell if something is a gray area or not is just to go back topic by topic and study what the Bible actually says, bearing in mind three vital issues. Context, context, and context. Those issues are very important because deep study and prayerful formation in the scriptures is the only way reliably to tell the difference between essentials and non-essentials. And people who neglect that deep work often veer off towards two different extremes. One extreme, some Christians put everything into the essentials bucket. Everything is essential, uh, and it's exhausting. Worship style, essential. King James Version of the Bible, essential. Voting for the correct political party, essential. The right end times charts and schemas, essential. How the pastor does his hair, essential. Everything is essential, and if the church doesn't accommodate them, they are out. They hold the whole church hostage to their convictions straight from the Lord. But you know what? In in my experience, these people typically have a paper-thin understanding of the Bible, like how it actually works historically, theologically, as, as a corpus of literature with sophisticated genres and techniques. They're in the dark about all of this stuff. I've met a lot of these people, highly idiosyncratic and unformed. And nevertheless, all of their convictions are in the essentials bucket. And as I said, it's exhausting. <laughs> At the other extreme, many so-called Christians put nothing in the essentials bucket. It's kind of all negotiable. You know, it's kind of all whatever. Repentance, nah. Nah. Sexual abstinence until marriage? Are you kidding me? That's like Victorian and prudish. Uh, Giving a full tithe? Are you serious? It's a scam. Don't do it. Who does that? Coming to church in person when I could stream in my jammies? That's inconvenient. Yes, I'm speaking to you. (laughs) Salvation through Jesus Christ alone? I don't get a good amalgam of Buddhism and blah, 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 blah. Oh, that is so small-minded. Who thinks that way? Well, actually, my friend, the boot is kind of on the other foot in terms of small-mindedness. Again, in my experience, those who hold that type of position usually don't even understand what they're rejecting. Like, it's all cartoons and caricatures. They straw man everything, steel man nothing. And anyways, many who pride themselves on being always tolerant and loving and inclusive uh, are very inconsistent with that position, actually. I know a guy once who's like, you know, people say I'm 
People say I'm intolerant about Jesus, but you know what? At my home, I, I have a Jeep, and I put it in my driveway, and I turn it on for hours, just let it run. You know why? I want to make a big hole in the ozone right above my house. And that's my dream. And people say, you can't do that. Yes, that's wicked. That's wrong. And I'm like, whoa, I thought you were like tolerant. You see, we're all intolerant about something. <laughs> I'm just intolerant about Jesus. Okay, you get the point. Here's the bottom line. This is going to clarify uh, what we're talking about. Yes, there's a difference between essentials and non-essentials. The only way to suss that out is topic by topic, Bible. Um, but as we seek in the non-essential gray areas to have liberty, and as we seek in all things to have charity, why? What's the driving reason? Paul says it's this in the next verses. He says, for none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live... We live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord, both of the dead and of the living. What's Paul saying? That bottom line, the reason to be gracious with each other in gray areas, even when it irks us, is a deep truth about our existence. Our lives are not our own. This is fundamental to the whole discussion here. We don't belong to ourselves. We belong to God who is more interested in our character than in our comfort. And it's, it's really important. Christianity is not about optimizing our comfort. No, Christianity is about uh, the almighty creator God choosing not to please himself not to coddle and cushify himself, but to empty himself out to zero in order to serve and save his muddled, confused, rebellious creatures, me and you. And this is where that as-so structure comes into play. As God inconvenienced himself for me, so I should be willing to inconvenience myself for you. Does that make sense? And this is, this is not like an optional extracurricular sort of thing. Uh, no, whether or not we ever learn to live by these deeper divine rhythms of preferring others to ourselves is something that the Bible says we're going to be held accountable to one day before God. Here's the next verse. Paul says this, So why do you pass judgment on your brother? Why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, and here he quotes Isaiah 45, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. The creator, God of all, has promised to put his whole creation back to rights one day. And an important piece of that process is determining for each one of us whether or not we ever learned how to live as true images of him, images of the loving, self-giving God. See, God's heart, God's desire, what drives him is to build people up, not tear them down. And that should rub off on us too. And it's, it's kind of tricky because that requires us to be thoughtful about it, but also to be willing to push pause on what we think if it's going to help someone else. So listen to how Paul uh, kind of teases this out. He says, therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer. Apparently we're doing this. We should stop. But rather decide. Mental process. I'm going to make a decision here. Decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. Now I know and am persuaded. Again, he's thinking here. I've thought this through. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. It's like Paul's going to eat the Hare Krishna candy, and he's like, whatever, God made this. But it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. And this is a deep truth, that as humans, our perception is our reality. So if, I, if something seems unclean, it's, it's unclean for me, it is unclean for me. We'll talk about what that means in a second. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. Now, 
Let's start right there. What does that mean to destroy someone else? Can a Christian through a foolish decision actually like send someone to hell? Is that what Paul's saying? No, I don't think so because just a few chapters prior in chapter 8, Paul said that absolutely nothing in all the universe can separate us from the love of God. So I don't think a knuckle-headed Christian is going to be able to separate us from the love of God. So what does he mean then by destroy someone? Well, I think the clue is a few verses on in chapter 14, verse 20, where Paul says this, do not for the sake of God destroy the work of God. Don't destroy the work of, what is the work of God? Well, it's, it's the unity of the church. It's also the process of maturation and character development in each individual Christian. In other words, as you exercise your Christian liberty, and you should, don't do it in such a way that is going to slow down or even sabotage someone else's process of maturation. Let me give you an example of how this works. A um, real-life example I read about while studying for this sermon. So there was a girl, a uh, high school girl from a strict Christian background who had been taught it is sinful for women to wear makeup. Okay? Uh, so that was her upbringing. But the peer pressure at school from other Christian girls raised in other churches led her to begin putting on makeup after she left for school in the morning and then wiping it off before she came home. Great strategy, right? Now, to be clear, the Bible doesn't condemn makeup. <laughs> like, that's not a thing. But because the girl didn't have clarity on this issue, she was acting against her conscience. And she felt very guilty about lying to her parents. And she got used to ignoring that pang of conscience. And she was ultimately choosing popularity over faithfulness to God. Okay, so this goes on for a while. And it opens the door to something else. Eventually, she finds herself open to real violations of God's will in the area of sexuality. So she stumbled because her Christian friends mocked her principles, even though they were misguided, they were incorrect. But you see, here's the the issue. You see how these strong Christian girls, even though they knew the right Bible answer about makeup, were still hurting their friend. Instead of walking in love, and you know, just downplaying the whole issue and just welcoming her as she is, they pressured her to act against her conscience. And once we get in the habit of doing that, ignoring the inner voice God has given us that says, hey, stay away from that and go towards that, once that becomes normal, we're in big trouble. The process of Christian maturation is thrown into reverse. We are destroyed. And here's the question. What is more important in the end, your makeup or your maturity? Like what what matters more, having a beer in Christian freedom or messing with your brother's weak conscience? There's an asymmetry here in importance. There's an imbalance, and that's what Paul wants us to see, and then once we see it, to act on it. Here's our last verses for today. He says, so do not let what you regard as good, and and it is good, be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. It's not about those things. Rather, it's about righteousness, justice, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's the the, the imbalance, the asymmetry. Whoever thus serves Christ, that's who we're ultimately serving when we serve each other, we're serving Christ, is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue We're not going to fall into it randomly. we got to think it through and go for it. Pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbringing. Guys, the kingdom of God is about these towering realities of shalom, of unshakable joy and interior freedom, of a time when God promises to saturate the whole world with his, his justice and his beauty. But the way that we turn the dial towards that every day in our lives is very practical we got to pursue these things. And how do we do it? Well, we can begin by answering a few questions uh, that our, our study today raised. Just being honest with yourself. Answer these questions. Do you have clarity on the distinction between commands and convictions? Do you ever take things that are more sort of personal conviction and ram it down other people's throats as a command from on high? Or do you ever take things that are a clear command from Scripture, but because they're uncomfortable and they pinch a bit, 
you, you, you want to water them down into, well, that's, that's kind of a conviction. The way to remedy these issues is Scripture. Are you a person, secondly, who tends to see everything as essential or nothing as essential? Because both extremes are unbiblical. Both extremes are unhealthy. Third, do you find yourself more bothered by the legalism of the weak or by the liberalism of the strong? And if so, like follow up on that. Why? Where's that coming from for you? What is, what's at stake? Number four, are you more invested in serving others or serving yourself? And that's something to keep tabs on all your life. It's, you know, that's a very, very deep issue. And then finally, this is the money question. This is the one that, that's beneath all the others. Do you fully belong to God? Because once you settle that core issue, my life is not my own. I belong to God. Everything else eventually falls into place. And how we choose that core attitude, the core direction of our life, is the issue. We live in a world that in many ways is well described by the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who taught that the will to power, the drive to power, is alive in each of us privately, secretly, and in our institutions, publicly, openly, we are driven to affirm ourselves, to lift up ourselves, to further our agenda, strategize how best to enjoy our freedom and liberty. And you know what? If someone else is the loser in the process, if someone else is smashed under the wheels of my pleasure bus, oh well. But that's not the way of God. Even God Almighty didn't say, I belong to myself. Rather, he said with infinite wisdom and love, I belong to the beloved. And only when we learn to say that do we become fully alive image bearers of God. When we are willing to die to our little plans and agendas, that's when we come alive to the cosmic agenda and plan of the kingdom of love, the kingdom of God. So let me close then with one of my favorite quotes of all time. This is from a 16th century monk who uh, lived in a, a, a monastery that was an Augustinian monastery. You know, the teachings of St. Augustine, the guy who said, in essentials, unity, non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. He was in a community dedicated to that proposition. And this monk, his name is Martin Luther. And he wrote this in his essay, Two Kinds of Righteousness. He said... Hey, Christian, you are powerful, not that you may make the weak weaker by oppression, but that you may make them powerful too by raising them up and defending them. You are wise, not in order to laugh at the foolish and thereby make them more foolish, but that you may undertake to teach them as you yourself would wish to be taught. You are righteous that you may vindicate and pardon the unrighteous, not that you may only condemn, disparage, judge, and punish. Why? What's the reason behind all this? Because this is Christ's example for us. As he says, Gospel of John, For God sent the Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Let's close with prayer in response. Would you bow your heads with me? Just have a moment of honesty with yourself. Say, Lord, search me. Where am I out of balance? Where am I confused? Where am I not contributing to unity and love, but preferring my own way? Taking us all the way back to our time of worship, Lord, what are those resistant places in my life that need to be just consumed? Just take it all. Lord, I just pray that your presence would be here. Only your presence can address each one of us as every man and woman in the house. You know where each of us are. And Lord, would you make us people of true love who are wise, who know how to stand up for what is true and who also know how to be gracious in things that at the end of the day are not essential. 
And Lord, may our unity be grounded in a deep vision of who Jesus is and what he achieved through his life and his death and his resurrection. Lord, help us to think things through, to be full grown-up Christians, but that that would be expressed, Lord, not through, not through arrogance and, and, and superiority, but through the acts of love and service to one another. Lord, help us as a church to be people who do not avoid each other when there's bad water in the stream, Lord, but people who approach each other and do the harder but better thing that love requires. Give us the courage to do that, Lord. It's not easy. I pray, Lord, especially for my friends who've actually never settled the core issue, do I belong to God? And Lord, in a way that they can understand, would you confront them with the truth that is actually liberating that our lives don't belong to us? That the goal here is not self-optimization. It is not the pleasure principle. It is not the fame principle. No, it's actually the service principle. It is actually humility and giving up that where we are actually raised up to new life, both in this life and in the life to come. Lord, draw men and women, even today, draw them home into the household of God. Help them to walk across the threshold into new purposes, new identities, healed emotions, healed imaginations, lies that have been circulating for a very long time. Cancel those for good and set us free into becoming true image bearers of the King. Help us to do that, Spirit of God. Would you be with us this week? Walk with us each day. Give us wisdom to know how to, how to act, how to be emissaries of a king. Help us to see people as you see them. Help us to, to be present where we are, but also to live for the horizon of the kingdom. Thank you, Lord, that you're faithful to do all these things. And so uh, we pray all of them in the name of the king, Jesus Christ, dead, buried, and resurrected evermore. And all God's people said... Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, um, would you uh, stand for a word of blessing before we head out? Now, let me just say on your drive home, don't go in the fast lane. Don't go in the slow lane. Go in the middle lane. Okay. <laughs> All right. In the name of Jesus. Okay. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face upon you and in the name of Jesus, may he gift you today with shalom, with peace. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.